be in there? We're all good? All right. It looks like we can begin. Certainly, this is a novel experience for all of us, and uh, I uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's STEM Cafe Stargazing. Uh, thank you for joining us for a dazzling evening of stargazing, viewing of the Percy media showers, and hearing from experts on stellar science. Tonight we will hear about microwave telescopes, the latest space exploration missions, and what's in the sky tonight. I certainly hope you can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Thank you. Uh, this, uh, our STEM campaigns are brought to you by NIU STEAM in the Center for Peak 20 Engagement at NIU. We usually hold these uh, STEM campaigns monthly. Our speakers tonight are Joel Knapper, uh, Chris Stoughton, and Jeremy Benson. I'm Dr. Judy Diamond, organizer of the STEM campaigns for the last eight years. NIU STEAM refers to science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. STEM cafes are designed to be a fun uh, engagement. Uh, people get together to, in a casual setting, to hear experts and ask questions and, and just have a discussion about these STEM topics. We usually hold them, in, uh, as I said, in monthly, uh, monthly in restaurants, and we really look forward to getting back to our restaurants. So tonight we have a blended event. Uh, we have an audience at home actually that uh, are online and we are live streaming this event. So, and uh, in about a week or two, we will actually have it recorded and have it online for anybody that was not able to be with us tonight. We uh, are obligated to have closed captions, so it takes us a week or two to get the, the uh, recorded uh, STEM Cafe out on, on our website. Anytime you're looking to find out when the next STEM Cafe is and you don't remember what I'm telling you this evening, if you go on N NIU's website and put in STEM Cafes, you will come to a calendar of our events and we hope that you will join us for the future. Uh, for those of you that maybe have not attended before, this, this evening is, is somewhat unique from the other STEM Cafes. But we're going to have talks until uh, 9 o'clock. We have three speakers. And then we are going to have a Q&A. And we are also taking questions from our home audience. So if uh, they want to write any questions down during the evening, they can. And uh, I'm going to pass out some little papers after we get started here so that you can write down a question, my live audience here. and. Uh, uh, and we will be able to get you into the discussion later. Um, our host this evening actually is the Open Range Southwest Grill, and I just want to tell you how excited we are to be here. We have held our STEM cafes here before, but they also are sponsors of our teen STEM cafes. So I just want you to know that and certainly come back. They have great food here. So anyway, I already mentioned to you about the questions. Um, for our remote audience, if you are having difficulty hearing during the presentation, there is a volume control in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, and you can uh, adjust your own volume. All right, I think we're going to get going. Um, and our first speaker is Joel Mapper. Joel? Uh, Joel is uh, a NASA ambassador. He's going to be speaking on NASA's return to the moon in 2024, how different our journey will be. Some of you may recognize Joel. He has been uh, so wonderful, and he actually has had, I think, 95 different talks uh, in a variety of different places, but for uh, for us, for NIU STEAM, I think he's done at least five talks. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty close. Anytime I ask uh, for his help, he's certainly there, and uh, we really uh, enjoy his talks. 
Uh, just a little bit about Joel. He has um, been a, a, a NASA ambassador for the last 12 years. And he says that he's been hooked on NASA since he was in grade school. He earned a bachelor's degree in English from Southern Illinois. He is an officer of his local amateur astronomy group, the Kankakee Area Stargazers, where he presents monthly uh, giving updates on NASA's uh, program. And as I said, uh, he has had uh, many, many presentations in the area. With that, I'm going to welcome Joel. Do you want to like to come in again? Oh, okay. Thanks, Judy. It is so nice to be out here with real people. I've done a lot of virtual things the last uh, last few months, but uh, it's amazing what technology has been that allows us to do that. Well, we're going to talk about uh, NASA going back to the moon. You know, we just uh, we just celebrated 50 years of the first moon landing here last July, and uh, we are getting ready to go back to the moon. In the next few years, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about the things that are the same about us going to the moon and the things that are a little bit different. Now, the program that we're going to the moon with is called the Artemis uh, program, uh, named after uh, the uh, uh, that's Apollo's sister, and she's the goddess of the moon. And again, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions, where we had. 12 astronauts walk on the moon. They ended in 1973, so it's like, well, why do we need to go back to the moon? Here you can see the areas that we actually uh, landed, the different missions we landed on the moon with, and we landed kind of in the equator part of the moon, because that was, frankly, the easiest to get there. It's amazing that we were able to do it with 1960 technology and computers uh, less powerful than the cell phone that you have in your pocket. But, you know, we brought back hundreds of pounds of rocks and soil, and everything, there was, everything was dry as a bone. No water at all in these moon samples. So we thought, oh, the moon's dry. Well, we were surprised as we sent spacecraft past the moon, uh, it would detect water. And so what we have since found is there is a lot of water on the moon. And when we go back to the moon, we're going to go to where the water is. Now... First thing we'll talk about is how do we get there? Now, when we were going to the moon, there were three real ways to get there. One was called direct ascent, where you build a giant rocket, you build one spacecraft, you send it to the moon, that whole spacecraft lands, astronauts go down probably a pretty big ladder to the moon, then they get back in their spacecraft, come back to Earth. That's probably the easiest way, but it takes a really powerful rocket to do that. The next way is Earth orbit rendezvous, where you have several launches of pieces of a spacecraft, and you, and you put it all together in Earth orbit, and then you head out to the moon. Okay? Problem with that method is if anything goes wrong with any of those pieces or any of those rocket launches, you're, you're out of a mission. And back in the 60s, we had a lot of problems with our rocket launches. The last way uh, that, we, that we had was called lunar orbit rendezvous, where you, you had to still build a pretty big rocket, but you only brought a little piece of that rocket, that spacecraft, back to Earth. And you would have a separate vehicle to actually land on the moon, meet back with that little piece, and then, and then all the astronauts would ride back to Earth, and you would only land a small piece of the uh, spacecraft. And that's really the way we decided to go with this lunar orbit rendezvous. Now here's an example of that direct ascent, how big that spacecraft had to be, and a pretty big ladder to get from the top to the, uh, to the surface of the moon if we had gone that way. Um, well, now we'll talk a little bit about the rockets we used to go to the moon. Uh, we, we built the Saturn V rocket, which was uh, the most powerful rocket still, the most powerful rocket ever flown. Uh, it, um, uh, to go to that direct ascent would have required the Nova rocket, which was much more powerful. And when we looked at it, there's no way we could have done that in the 60s. So we decided to build the Saturn V rocket uh, larger than the Statue of Liberty. There is uh, Werner von Braun, one of the uh, German uh, uh, rocket uh, engineers who helped design the Saturn V. 
and uh, that's what we use to go to the moon. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the spacecraft. Uh, we use uh, what we call the Apollo uh, Command and Service Modules. So this is actually the only part of the spacecraft that would actually come back to Earth. The three astronauts would be aboard this part of the ship. This is a service module that contained a rocket to, to get them into lunar orbit, bring them back to Earth. It also had the, you know, the main oxygen supplies and the power supplies uh, for the spacecraft. And then we had a separate vehicle called the Lunar Lander, which had two parts to it. It had a descent stage to get down onto the moon, and then an ascent stage that would lift off the moon and bring the astronauts back to that command module for that trip back to Earth. So we, we built these two vehicles uh, to, to get to the moon and back, and they were all part of the Saturn V rocket. Um, the other thing we did, we, we had to learn a few things about the moon before we sent astronauts there. So we sent some unmanned spacecraft to the moon. The first spacecraft we sent was some Ranger spacecraft. And they were basically spacecraft with some uh, cameras on it that would snap pictures as it got closer and closer and closer to the moon, finally crashing into the moon. The first, six, uh, the first six rangers failed, but the last three worked, and we got some very close-up pictures of the moon. Uh, the next spacecraft we sent were called the Lunar Orbiters, uh, and these spacecraft went into orbit around the moon and took some detailed pictures so we could figure out a good, safe landing area to land the astronauts. This is one of the famous pictures that was sent back uh, of the Earth in the, in the background there. And then we also sent spacecraft to land on the moon. We weren't sure if we landed a spacecraft on the moon, we thought maybe it would sink into a lot of soil. Uh, we didn't know how much dust was on the moon. So we sent some surveyor spacecraft that made soft landings on the moon, sent back pictures. This was an artist uh, 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 painting of what it would be like to land next to one of these spacecraft. And we actually did on Apollo 12, the astronauts actually landed near one of the surveyor spacecraft, and you could see their, their uh, lunar module back here, and they walked over to the surveyor spacecraft, and uh, pieces of that surveyor spacecraft are at the National Air and Space Museum. If you ever get a chance to go to Washington, you can see pieces of, of the spacecraft that they brought back. The last thing we'll talk about is the crew. So this was the 60s. It was a time that we had... Um, uh, we had uh, basically test pilots who, who were brave enough and we thought were good enough for this dangerous mission to go to the moon. So here are the crews of the, of the missions that went to the moon. They even include Apollo 13, which had a failure on the way to the moon and, and, and didn't land. But the rest of these crews, uh, uh, these, these uh, men, landed on the moon and returned. Just a few of them left alive, actually, at this point. So here is a, a little video of Apollo 11 uh, 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 launching with the Saturn V. Again, one of the most, or the most powerful rocket ever launched. Uh, all of these Saturn Vs uh, worked flawlessly and uh, got all these astronauts uh, out to the moon on these dangerous um, missions three days away from Earth. Uh, so uh, the, the, the rocket would launch the command module and the service module and the lunar module. A couple astronauts would get into the lunar module, go down to the surface of the moon. Uh, here you can see on Apollo 11, you can see that Neil Armstrong is at the base of the spacecraft and you can see Buzz Aldrin uh, coming out of the hatch of the spacecraft. That's a picture of Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, taken by Neil Armstrong, which you can kind of see his reflection in the visor of, uh, of Buzz Aldrin there. And then here's a video of one of the later Apollos. I think it's Apollo 16. You can kind of, they left a camera there, and you'll get, actually get to see the, the, uh, the, the ascent stage separating from the descent stage to go back into orbit here. Excellent. 
Here you have good front. So the two astronauts are in the ascent stage. It's pitching over. They'll dock with the command module, and that will return them to Earth. So that's basically uh, how we went to the moon. Here is the uh, command module getting ready to dock with the, or the lunar module getting ready to dock with command module. And then the, the small little piece of the spacecraft, the Apollo capsule, uh, came into the Earth's atmosphere, put some parachutes out, and they were picked up um, in the ocean. All right. Now we're going to talk about how we're going back to the moon with Project Artemis, which is uh, slated to happen the next few years. So how will we get there? Well, we're going to use rockets, but we're going to use lunar orbit rendezvous. We're going to use the same sort of way. We're going to build a spacecraft to go out to the moon and a spacecraft to land on the moon. But a few things are a little different here. The rocket that we're going to use is called the Space Launch System. Now, it's based on a space shuttle. It almost looks like a space shuttle external tank. These main engines use hydrogen and oxygen, and they're actually space shuttle main engines that they are reusing for the first few flights. Also, those of you who remember the space shuttle, uh, these are solid rocket boosters on the side. They're a little bit longer than, uh, than the ones that were on a, a normal space shuttle. You can see a comparison of the space launch system compared to the space shuttle here. Uh, and then you can see the space launch system. There's two versions. This is the first version that has a little uh, less powerful second stage and then a more powerful upper stage for the, for the second version compared to the Saturn V. And this rocket will be more powerful than the Saturn V that took us to the moon in the 60s. Another, th another key difference <laughs> is when the space shuttle was brought out to the launch pad, the launch pad was kind of built in place there at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. But when we bring the space launch system out, it will carry the launch gantry with it. So this big crawler will carry the space launch system and the launch gantry in one piece yeah. out to, the, out to the, the launch pad. I have a little video of what this will look like next year when the sp first space launch system rocket launches from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. stage gets it up into orbit where the second stage takes over and takes it on out to the moon. But now we'll talk a little bit about the spacecraft we're going to use. We are building a spacecraft called the Orion, which looks a lot like the Apollo spacecraft. It's a capsule-like spacecraft with a service module using solar panels instead of uh, fuel cells that the Apollo used. You can see it's a little bit wider and taller than Apollo capsule. It's built to carry at least four astronauts at a time, where the Apollo capsule carried three astronauts. Here you can see uh, the Orion compared to the SpaceX Dragon uh, capsule that just returned with a couple of astronauts a couple weeks ago, and the Boeing spacecraft, which will launch later this year on another unmanned test flight, which will eventually take astronauts up to our space station. Now, I've got a little video that talks about the launch of, of Orion out to the moon. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch, should anything go wrong. 
To accomplish the task of launching our crew and heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. So just like in the Apollo days, it's a three-day journey then from Earth orbit to the moon. But here's where things get a little bit different. So instead of the lunar uh, command module going into orbit around the moon, the Orion is going to be headed to a different place. It's going to be headed to the Lunar Gateway. The Lunar Gateway is like a space station, a small space station in orbit at a Lagrange point around the moon. Now, it's not as big as our International Space Station, which is an Earth orbit. It's, it's made to hold a crew for just maybe 30, 60 days at the most. Now, there are certain spots where the, where the gravity of the sun and the earth and the moon balance each other out. So if you put an object at one of these spots called a Lagrange point, they pretty much stay there. And that's where we're going to place this lunar gateway. We're going to place it at the, at the L2 Lagrange point. So we're going to send the Orion to this mini space station, and then the crew will get into a lunar lander to go down to the moon. Instead of for three days with the Apollo, uh, they'll stay at least a week. So I have a little video that talks about their trip down to the, uh, to the moon. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released, and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. So the reason we're using a gateway, a space station around the moon, is we want to go back to the moon to stay. This little space station can be used to build a spacecraft that will eventually go to Mars. It can be used to get fuel and water and supplies and things that are maybe manufactured on the moon. Uh, it, can, it can hold that, 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 uh, those supplies and, and uh, be used as sort of a base uh, around the moon. So... It's, uh, it's, a, it's a location that can be expanded, and instead of like the Apollo days where we were there just to beat the Russians and come back, we want to have a presence uh, at the moon. Now, the last piece that we, are, that we need to get down to the moon is a new lunar lander. 
And there, NASA just this summer announced three uh, companies uh, that are going to compete to build a lunar lander. NASA may pick two of the three, or they may just pick one, but they have about a year to prove out their concept and get this built. So there's three options for going to the moon. Uh, the first one is by a team led by a company called Dianetics. And they built, or they, they proposed building a spacecraft that the crew would be in this section here. It would carry a crew of two. They could spend a, at least a week on the surface. Uh, when they would come in to land, these solar panels would not be uh, in the deployed position. They would be kind of rolled up like curtains. And when they landed on the moon, they would unroll these uh, solar panels for power. And they would be actually pretty close to the surface, so they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be a stretch to get out of the capsule. It would be pretty easy to get on the surface of the moon. And then when they left the moon, the whole unit would launch, go back to the space station, the, the um, space station in the moon orbit, and then probably reused for another mission, just resupplied. Uh, the next spacecraft that's in competition for this lunar, lunar lander is from SpaceX. It's called the S SpaceX Starship. Now SpaceX is working on a total, totally reusable rocket. A first stage with maybe 29 engines, a second stage with uh, maybe five engines. They would, they would reuse both the first stage and the second stage, and they envision taking the second stage, which would be the, the starship, to the moon, and eventually to, to Mars. Uh, they, they have, you know, Elon Musk talks about launching this spacecraft three times a day. So that's another one of the competition. And the third vehicle is called the... Um, I wrote it down just to make sure, because they're all acronyms here. Uh, this is the Integrated Landing Vehicle. Now, this is a proposal by a company called Blue Origin, which is owned by Jeff Bezos of Amazon. And he's proposing a vehicle that has uh, two sections, an ascent stage and a descent stage. So the astronauts would have a pretty long ladder to, to get down. Uh, but they would, uh, they would spend a week on the surface, and then just the ascent stage would go back up uh, to the lunar gateway, and they could reuse that. They would just have to add a new descent stage uh, to go to take another trip down to the moon. So these are the three vehicles that are proposed, and NASA, again, they'll choose either one or two of them uh, to be built to get astronauts back on the moon. Now, we are doing some uncrewed missions to get ready for this visit back to the moon. Uh, the first couple were launched in 2009. This is called the uh, LaCrosse spacecraft. Now, what the LaCrosse did is it used its empty second stage rocket, and it crashed that rocket into the southern part of the moon, and then the spacecraft, which had a bunch of sensors and cameras, flew through the plume that, that, uh, that uh, rose up from that explosion where that rocket, hit, that, uh, rocket stage hit the moon, and it was meant to detect water, which it did. It, it did detect water, proving that our sensors are right. There's a lot of water ice on the moon, uh, mostly hidden in um, craters that are shielded from the sun all of the time. So, the LCROSS mission proved that there is water there at the southern part of the moon. Uh, this is an animation uh, of, of the stage hitting the moon, and then the LCROSS actually flying into the plume right after it. I remember in 2009, this happened early in the morning, and people thought they might be able to see the plume. We really couldn't see the plume. Uh, it was so far away. But the uh, spacecraft detected um, the water uh, thrown up from that stage. Now, on that same mission, we put an orbiter around the moon uh, called the, the Lunar Orbiter, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's like a, it's almost like a spy satellite that's around the moon, taking very, very close pictures of the moon. 
uh, so close, in fact, it, it captured pictures of where we actually landed on the moon. So this is the Apollo 17 landing site. You can see the descent stage. You can see uh, tracks from the lunar rover, which those astronauts drove along the moon, and you can see the experiments that they set up. So for those people who say we didn't land on the moon, uh, we actually have uh, some photo evidence of our, of our uh, spacecraft that, and our uh, experiments that we left on the moon. Uh, in 2023, we're going to land a rover on the south part of the moon. Uh, this rover uh, is, being, is being delivered by a company called Astro Robotic out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they have a lander which is going to land this Viper rover on the moon that NASA is supplying. It's about 500 pounds. And it's, it will work for about 100 days. And what it's going to do is find water, drill into it, and, and send back information about the density and uh, the makeup of that, of that water. So they will use the Viper to help figure out where we're going to actually land on the moon when we send astronauts there. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is the crew. You know, we talked about in the 60s, the crew is pretty much test pilots, an all-male crew, uh, but uh, the, the administration and the president has said that on this first landing on the moon, there will be a, a, a woman astronaut will be part of that crew to land on the moon. So uh, one, of these, uh, one of these astronauts is looking forward to maybe being the first uh, female to walk on the moon when we go back. Now, uh, we want to go back in, by 2024. That's our plan. So let me tell you what the current status is. The Orion spacecraft for the first unmanned mission is ready to go, ready to launch. We've actually launched uh, the Orion before, un uncrewed. The, the, the next launch of this Orion that you see in this picture will go out to the, out to the moon and, and back to Earth as a test. This is a space launch system. This is the first rocket. They completed it this year, and it is in base uh, Mississippi, um, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, at the Stennis Space Center, and they are go they're getting ready to test it in the next couple months. When I say test it, they're going to fire all four engines for the nine minutes that they would fire, just to make sure everything works correctly. Once they tested it out, they will clean it up, put it on a barge, take it down to Florida, and get ready for this launch next year. So next year, we will launch, if everything goes okay, we will launch a space launch system for the first time with that uncrewed Orion. And then in 2023, we will launch the first crew. They will go around the moon and back. And then we hope in 2024 that that lunar um, that lunar lander is ready and we'll, we will go to the surface of the moon. Uh, as far as the Lunar Gateway Space Station, um, it, uh, we have started building that. Actually, they're going to launch the habitation module and the power and propulsion module together. Uh, they haven't announced it officially yet, but the, the secret, that's not a real secret, is that SpaceX Falcon Heavy is going to launch that combination to the, to the Lagrange point, so that will be where those astronauts will go uh, when they get ready to land on the moon. And uh, we are just waiting for NASA to decide who has <laughs> the best technical plan to get our lunar lander ready. So one of these three companies, one of these three lunar landers, or maybe two, will be chosen for the lunar landing uh, on the moon. So I will show you one last video. This is from last week. Uh, this is of the SpaceX uh, Starliner uh, doing its little hop test on, on their testing for uh, getting this Starliner ready.
just last so just last week the first Starliner hop test actually was carried out. Eventually, uh, SpaceX hopes to build a fleet of starships, and one of them could actually land the astronauts uh, on the moon. Uh, yeah, yep. So, again, the, the point of going back to the moon is to test the technology and the ability to actually uh, go on to Mars. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention. I hope you learned a little bit about how uh, we went to the moon and how we're planning to go to the moon. Watch for that space launch system uh, launch, first launch next year, and uh, the Viper rover, and then uh, eventually the crewed missions uh, out to the moon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. We always enjoy your talks. Uh, and, and thank you, audience, for uh, using uh, your masks and being huskies and uh, social distancing. We really appreciate it. We're trying to follow all of the rules today. Our next speaker is uh, Chris Toten. He is uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Toten from Fermilab, and he is a Fermilab scientist. And he has been so kind as to say that he would come and talk to you today. His, uh, what he normally does, or has been doing for several years, is working on maps, uh, mostly with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. But recently, he is now working on a new project uh, to make sensitive maps of the universe using microwave radiation. He will be speaking tonight on microwave maps of matter and energy. So with that, Chris, can you tell us all about mapping the universe? Sure, thank you. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate the chance to come and meet all of you. Hope the sound is working OK. Yes. OK, good. Um, so why microwaves? Right. It's, the mo it's, it's of the three talks you can get tonight, the first one was very, very specific. We can all think about jumping into a spaceship and going to the moon. That's very easy to think about. In fact, Judy, did you send out the, the sign-up sheets? I think they're looking for some volunteer astronauts. Maybe we'll get a few, few volunteers to do that. Well, and the, the, the candidates right here. The candidates right here, good. And the, the last talk, Jeremy's going to tell us about what we can actually see in the night sky. That's going to be very practical. What is the, What are those two bright things there? Um, I won't spoil alert, they're Jupiter and Saturn. But <laughs> he's going to show you a bunch of other things too, and maybe even some meteors, so that's very practical. This is the most impractical talk of the three. Let's talk about microwaves. And why, mi why microwaves? Um, they're the way that astronomers measure the afterglow of the Big Bang. So if you want to have one image from what I'm talking about today, think about a campfire that has gone out that you come upon the next day, and the ground is warm there, and you conclude, wow, that's pretty warm. I bet you that last night it was a really big bonfire. By looking at the embers, you can kind of figure out what was going on with the fire at a time. That's exactly what we're doing. Now, at the same way, microwaves are not very strange. We all have one of these at home. I'm sure you've seen this view in your house. Well, maybe not this exact view. <laughs> maybe if you trap yourself in the microwave. But we all know what this guy is doing, right? Come home after a long day at work. Uh, grab something out of the refrigerator, nook it in the microwave. He did not poke holes in it, so I'm going to leave that up to his, his uh, jurisdiction about the, what, what the right way to do is, the, the right way to do. Um, now, we know that having grandma come over and cook her favorite dish smells of the house much better and is tastier, but microwaves are so doggone convenient. Right? We use them probably every day. Very, very um, common thing for us to run into. I'd like you to think about this as a science experiment, where we're going to tease out something invisible that's going on. In the same way that we can tease out what happened with the Big Bang, which we can't see directly because it already happened. In the same way, we can find out what's going on with invisible little molecules in there. I'm going to give you a model here of what's going on inside. Every atom, every molecule of water has got a little bit of electric charge difference. 
and likes to spin around at a very specific frequency. So I give it an electric wave at just the right frequency, that little guy is going to start humming around very quickly. Now, we can't see those molecules directly, but I just gave you a, a model picture of what it is, and now we can test it. I'm going to put in electromagnetic radiation at just the right frequency. I'm going to read this off my sheet to make sure I get it right here. Um, about two and a half billion times a second, it's going to spin around. So if you put in energy with just that same frequency, that energy, just like pushing a kid on a swing, will absorb will be absorbed by the water molecules, and they'll be spinning faster and faster and faster and faster. Now, we can't see them spinning, but when molecules start moving around faster, we all know what that means. What happens with something if I start moving your molecules around faster? What, what does it, it do? Up. It warms up, right? Yay, thank you. So this is, a, and this is the oven. This is where you warm things up. The refrigerator is the other thing. We'll talk about that physics later. Okay. So if that, model, if that model I told you about is correct, then when you put stuff in the microwave, it warms up. And I bet we all do this experiment many, many times a week, probably a few times a day. Another experiment you can do, by the way, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you look, at, look this up on the internet, is you can measure the speed of light inside your microwave. You can actually get a pretty good answer. You can look, there's a little sticker on the back of your microwave, not the 60 hertz one, but it says it's 2.45 gigahertz. It tells you what that frequency is. And if you put a layer of food in there, and this will let you be good experimentalists and decide what to use, I find that those little tiny marshmallows, make a nice layer of those. Very important, take the rotating thing out. You don't want them rotating for this. You want them sitting still. Okay? And make a layer of that. A chocolate bar works. A nice layer of meringue. So experiment, see what you do. But go ahead and turn on the microwave. And there'll be a wave put in there, just like if I had a, a string tied to that post there and started to get shaking up and down, like a jump rope, you would see there'd be a wave pattern standing in there. So in the same way, there'll be hot spots and cold spots that will burn little pieces or brown little pieces of your marshmallows. Measure the distance between the two of those. That's going to be half the wavelength and multiply that out times the frequency, you're going to wind up getting the speed of light. And if you work all those numbers out, you actually get a pretty good number. Right? You can do that within a few percent. That's very nice to see. So that's another sort of experiment we can do. We have this model that microwaves are just like light, and they travel at a certain speed, and I can measure that speed, and I get the speed of light out. Again, we've had a measurement confirms what a model says. Okay. What are we doing here? This is a great example that even after the fire goes out, things are still hot. I mean, the second thing you can remember from this talk is everything glows. The sun glows, that's good, right? Um, a fire, after it goes out, those embers glow. You can see them in the dark, right? Lava flows glow. If you've ever been to Hawaii, after the sun goes down, the whole mountain's glowing. And you realize that I'm standing on lava here. What am I doing here? But anyway, that's, just, that's another problem. Um, and in fact, even though there are no flames coming up, you can cook your cakes, steaks, I believe they call this caveman style, where you pepper them up, maybe brush off the, the dust off the ashes a little bit, put the steaks right on there, and they'll cook right up. Now, the problem is that if, you, if the fire is not big enough, well, then you're going to have raw steaks at the end. So you better like your steaks very rare or medium rare. But if you have enough memories there, you can cook yourself up a nice steak. It's, it's, it's a really interesting way to cook up your steaks. Right? Um, the fact that warm things glow has been observed for over 100 years. But exactly how it glows is a bit of a controversy. Say in the late 1800s, people calculated what the... Um, you know, how things should glow, and they got an answer that does not match what we observe. The answer is that if you're glowing right now, you're going to give off, in a second, an instant amount of energy. <clears throat> That's not what happens, because when they come back to the fire overnight, it hasn't given up all its energy, it's still glowing. And noodling out why that 
theory that explained everything else about gases and electricity and magnetism and heat and entropy and thermodynamics all worked out, except for this one thing is how do things glow? What color are they when they glow? The short answer is that Max Planck just said, well, I give up. Let's just assume that energy comes out in discrete chunks. Instead of coming out continuously, you come out in specific particles. We'll call those quanta, and we'll call this thing quantum mechanics. And he turned the crank and calculated how things glow and got the answer that we've seen all along. So that was the birth of quantum mechanics. So if anyone ever asks you if you know why quantum mechanics works, it says, well, it's because fires glow and you can cook steaks on them. <laughs> it's really great evidence that quantum mechanics works. Okay, finally, some astronomy. This guy's been talking about food the whole time. Finally, we're going to do some astronomy. The blast of a giant atom. I really like this because it was way back in 1932, right? So this was one of the first descriptions of what we now call the Big Bang Theory. Uh, Father Lemaitre, um, after hearing about Hubble's measurements, that every galaxy we see is in fact running away from us, which either man, means we have very bad social skills, and when you walk into a room, everyone runs away from us. Or, what it's a better to think about is it's as if giants were stretching um, the floor, the ground beneath us. And if you thought giants started tugging at and pulling us away, even though we were all sitting in our seats, right? I'm confused now about how picnic tables work into this. <laughs> but uh, for all of you sitting in individual chairs, um, I, that's really a, that's an interesting complication. I'm going to have to come back to that later. Sorry, I got distracted. If the giants were stretching the ground beneath us, you two would slowly start drifting apart from each other. This group back here would slowly start drifting away from each other. And you would notice that the farther away someone is, the faster they're moving away from you. And that's what you would wind up seeing. So just think about that for a second. And then also you would want to ask, well, where is the center of the stretching going on? Well, every single one of us would see, well, that person's moving away that way, that person's moving away that way, those people out there are moving away fast that way, those people, so clearly, I'm the center of the universe. So when you go home and talk to your parents, this is a trick, youngsters out there, when you go talk to your parents, you can tell them it's been scientifically proven, as I've been trying to tell you all these years, that indeed, mom and dad, I am the center of the universe. And they'll agree with you, by the way. So use that. Don't 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 overplay that hand, but it's very handy. That's just just a, a trick there. Okay, so that's the idea of the expansion of the universe. If you play that movie backwards, and now the giants were all squishing us together, and as you compress something, you've probably pumped up a tire. It gets hot, right? It gets hotter and hotter and hotter. So the, the natural conclusion is, back in the olden days, right, billions of years ago. When the universe was very dense, it was also very hot. And that's the key we're doing. That's the, that's the, that's the key, key, key element here. Because in addition to the running away of the galaxies, there should be a second clue to what's going on. And that's there's an ember that's glowing. And we're going to measure that glow. How much is it glowing? And that's the, that's the big deal about, about the microwave background radiation. OK, so first, let's look in detail about how things glow. But I need to take a poll first. Who here hates math? Come on, be honest. Who hates math? Who's got to do more math here? Okay. okay, so, okay. One graph. Don't get up and run away. It's going to be fine. It will not hurt you. Okay. This tells you how much light comes out as a function of the wavelength of the light. Okay? For things at different temperatures. So for a very hot star, 15,000 degrees, you see, first of all, a lot more light comes out everywhere than something that's cold, a 3,000 degree star. Right? So you get a lot more light up. Hot things are bright. OK, that makes sense. And the color is different. Very hot things have shorter wavelengths. They're more blue. Um, cold things have longer wavelengths and they're more red. And we're very familiar with the visible spectrum here. That's right here. We're a little bit biased toward thinking about that kind of radiation, because that's what our eyes are sensitive to. And 
It's no coincidence that the sun gives out its most light right here where our eyes have to be visible happen to be sensitive to that visible light. That's what we call the visible light. But look what happens here. When the blue, when the really hot star is glowing, it's giving you more blue than red. Okay? So it's a blue star. A cold thing gives you more red than blue. So we say, well, that thing is red. And you have to keep this straight here. Hot, short wavelength, blue, cold, red. Hot, blue, cold red. Do you see now why sometimes astronomers have trouble in the shower? <laughs> it, it happened to me once. So you, you, you see the things. Oh, we need more cold water, so I'll make that. Wait a second. Okay. Now, the other neat thing here is that if you turn the temperature way down to 300 degrees above absolute zero, that's about what a human is, we're still glowing. So you and I glow. Now, right now, I'm seeing scattered light off of the sun or off of these lights, scatters off of your shirt or off of your skin, and it's more like that's how we normally see each other. But in the absence of that, after the sun goes down and it gets really, really dark, you would still be glowing. And this wavelength is much longer than wavelengths of light that we're, 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 we're accustomed to seeing that we can see with our, with our eyes. In fact, these touchless thermometers that we're, we see all over the place now, where they just scan your forehead, say what your temperature is, right? takes very careful measurements at a couple of these wavelengths and compares the ratios. Just like you can compare the ratio, if you're more blue than red, um, you're hot and you have a temperature and you, this star needs to quarantine itself for two weeks. Uh, but if you've got less of this light than that light, you're more red, you're colder. Right? So these things are calibrated up. They're actually good within like a degree or something. It's pretty amazing how, how careful they've done. It's much, much easier. Um, I think doctors say a, a true measurement is the thermometer um, <clears throat> in one end or the other. Yet that's the only temperature I think a doctor will really trust. But for quick checking, these scans are really, really good. OK. So here's the problem when the unit, so uh, the universe then was predicted to be colder, about 10 degrees of about absolute zero, which means the wavelength would be way, way out here. Right? And this wavelength light, we happen to call the microwave range. OK, here's a picture of a telescope, the first one that measured this background radiation, uh, made by, made by Pendus and Wilson. They worked with Bell Lab, a telephone company. They built it as an antenna for help in communication. Okay, the telephone company, you got to figure out how to, you know, this was before 5G or 4G. This was really the precursors to wireless uh, communications, right? And the problem they had is after they built it, right, they had more noise on it than they expected. Now, I don't know anybody who works with electronics. Certainly, you guys are working a lot to get the noise down so that it's not <sighs> that static noise. If you've got a connection, having noise in the background is always, is always nasty. So they were going crazy trying to figure out what is this noise. No matter where they pointed the telescope, there was noise. It even got to the extent that they thought that perhaps birds were nesting in here, and birds doing what birds do um, was affecting the dielectric constant here. So these guys, they weren't dressed like this one. They got inside, scrubbed it up, cleaned up, still no noise. Lucky for them, down the street at Princeton University, some theoretical physicists were saying, hey, if the universe, I'm finally back to the universe now. If the universe is this ember and glowing, it should give off this radiation in about the frequencies they were looking at. It should be excess of anything else you can explain from Earth, and it should be everywhere, no matter where you point the telescope. So what was these guys' problem is the signal that the professors at Princeton were going to actually build a telescope to, to make. A third party heard the two stories and said, hey, <clears throat> you guys should talk. They did, and Pentheus and Wilson wound up getting the Nobel Prize for this. In 1964, they made this measure. Um, right, let me just see now. Let me see what that, that, that. Ah, a very nice point as a story. I'm glad I looked at my notes. Is by this time, Father Lemaitre was a very advanced in age, um, 
and had retired and stuff, but word got to him that they had measured the excess radiation predicted by his last of a giant atom, literally weeks before he passed away. So that's kind of a nice conclusion. It took 30 years, so you have to be patient with science, but um, it worked. Okay, now in the intervening time, people thought of other explanations for why there could be a little more, and instead of just one big atom being created at the beginning of time, an alternate thing is to say that continuously throughout space and time, every once in a while, new atoms appear. And whether you think that theory is more crazy than the theory of the Big Bang, it's kind of like a beauty contest, and you can have your opinions one way or the other. The key difference is that the standard Big Bang model predicts that the spectrum will be exactly the shape of a thermal spectrum. And the solid state, the steady state theory has it more peak with a large tail out here. So it doesn't match the solid state theory. The Big Bang theory predicts exactly the shape and this is exactly what you see. And we've all plotted graphs and drawn a line through the picture, through the, the point, and you're happy when it goes through the error bars. This looks pretty good, right? Now you've got to wind up that they've plotted, these error bars are so small, they've blown them up by a factor of 400, right? I mean, this, when this presentation was given at an American Physics Society meeting, basically the scientists just showed the plot and said, here's the spectrum with the error bars, 400 times bigger than they really are in real life. It matches. It was like the shortest talk ever. Everyone got up in the end of the innovation, and they got the Nobel Prize, too. I, I was very fortunate to be able to speak with a couple of people um, who worked on this project, and they were in the control room when the first vector were down, and they looked at it and says, we got it, our instrument's going to work well enough. And they saw right away, it's a black body, this is beautiful. Okay, once you've done that and made one measurement, we're done, right? We can go home. We've measured that the Big Bang happened. Yeah, but you give scientists a new thing to measure, we'll say, oh, but you know what we can do now? Is it exactly the same temperature everywhere? Let's point the telescope there. Now let's point it there. Now let's point it there. And measure the temperature. And sure enough, you get the same temperature everywhere. Maybe you've seen these ovals before. It's a really handy-dandy way to stretch out the entire globe and print it flat. You know there's a problem with opening up the orange peel and printing it out? This kind of projection shows you the whole Earth all the way around, right? And if you go from east to west, these things join, sort of like a Pac-Man. You guys still play Pac-Man? Is that still a thing? Pac-Man? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Are you back there? You know what Pac-Man? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, good. So we're, we're culturally all on the same stage. Here. So, so, this goes, so this is just a nice way to show the whole globe, right? Um, so it's all the same temperature. If you zoom in a little bit, you see at a few millikelvin, there's a difference. This direction is hotter than this direction. Wait a second, is which one's hot, blue or red? I forget. So don't. Well, but when they made some of these early plots, they flipped them back to the easier people understand it. And I've been confused ever since. So I'm sorry about that. So it's moving one way direction, one way, one direction or the other. So we're moving through this radiation. It's the Doppler shift. Just like when a siren is coming at you, it's got a higher tone and a lower tone after it goes past. Here it's got a higher tone here and a lower tone here. We're moving at a few hundred, I forget the exact number, kilometers per second. So it means you could cross the United States in like 10 seconds or something at that speed, you know, with no traffic. <laughs> and, you know, stopping for speeding tickets. But how would they catch you? <laughs> but that's, 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 so we're really hauling through this, this cotton here. So you take that out, and finally you're seeing the clumpiness that is the afterglow of the Big Bang. And this should not be completely smooth, and it is not. And in fact, you take now, look at math with more and more details, because again, once a scientist has made a map, this was a Colby map in 92, yeah, we can build a better one and take a sharper picture. It's kind of a fuzzy picture we took. Let's take a sharper picture. Okay, this is so-called W map that we did it. You say, yeah, we can do even better. Right? So this is the Planck satellite that got a much better image here. And what you're seeing here is in micro degrees. There's little variations where in the early universe, I see, I don't know which what blue and red is here. But one of them is over dense, the other is under dense. And these are the little seeds 
that then gravitationally collapsed to form galaxies and clusters of galaxies and stars and planets and people and golf courses that were in right? So this is looking back to just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, and these are the clumps that then wound up forming into, well, this one is forming into a galaxy that's on the other side of the universe. So these are the kinds of maps that we make, and the things we can, the other thing we can learn from that is how much dark matter and dark energy is in the universe. How clumpy it is, how, ch how chunky it is, just like you can look at, you know, chocolate chip cookies after they're made, and you can say, ah, oh, that one had more sugar in it, this one had more baking powder in it, this one had more butter in it. I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other, I'll take all three of them. They're all good, right? But after looking at the consistency, you can say what, what ingredients went in there. Right? In the same way, what are the ingredients? There are clues there, and it would take a lot of math to show that. And I've been admonished to not use too much math, so I'll skip the graphs and do that. Okay. So, are we done? No. No. Right? This is the South Pole Telescope. Um, guess where it's located? <laughs> no, it's the South Pole. Um, <laughs> There's a story about that, about, about a, 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 wait, this is being recorded? I won't play that story. Um, but anyway, and this was taken not when they were observing, but just points out that you can actually walk around on this mirror. If you walked around on the mirror of an optical telescope, you would get yelled at because you'll scratch it up and distort it. But the wavelengths are so long here, it's just metal plates you can walk on. Um, it looks kind of like a telescope. It's this big dish, 10 meters in diameter, so pretty much the size of this area here. The light reflects up here, then gets fed into the cameras. There's a 30,000 or 15,000 or so individual pixels that are measuring what is the temperature of the sky at each of those locations. And they slowly move this around. Um, and at the South Pole, there's other, this is the Boomerang Telescope, so it sort of shares a port building. Um, there's some balloons that fly from there. So there's six or seven, depending on how you count, cosmic micro background experiments going on now. Completely measuring the universe. Are we done? No. No, good. Well done. And this brings me to the final conclusion. You, the taxpayers, thank you very much for this, um, are hopefully, it looks like this is going to be the next big thing in cosmic microwave background. CMB, so called stage four. And this shows you um, sort of how sensitive you are. So this is the W map and the Planck. But every five to 10 years, you get better detectors that are more sensitive. This is what we're doing now here. And this is what we do to, to, with cosmic microwave background is for. And what are the, some of the things we're going to measure with this? Again, I can't take you out and show you. So you have to sort of trust me with this. But we can now look at um, primordial gravitational waves. We can sort of look behind that afterglow. And there's going to be some imprints on that of an amazing thing that happened in the early universe called inflation. One of the problems we have in the universe is it's so doggone uniform. How did it get to be so uniform? It's driving us crazy. One idea for that is inflation, and a smoking gun for that would be gravitational waves. It would be great if that turns out to be true. Um, Miller measure waves in the dynamic sky. We'll see the dynamic sky. We're used to looking at the sky saying, oh, it's the same all the time. Well, we're going to see hopefully some dynamics tonight when meteors come through. But on a larger scale, all sorts of things are blowing up and uh, turning on and off at the night. It'll give us clues about, say, how black holes coalesce and so on. Um, matter mapping in the cosmos. I told you earlier that all the different measurements, we was telling someone at the dinner table here, um, all the different measurements of how much dark energy, how much dark matter, how fast the universe is expanding, dozens of experiments are all kind of getting the same answer. It's kind of great, right? There's a little bit of disagreement on the edges, um, so you want to look more carefully and closely at that. Maybe there's a third thing we don't even know about here. And finally, one of the big embarrassments is we've been saying for dozens of years now there's missing matter in the universe. Um, more than just the stuff I stuff under my bed. There's a lot more than that, right? Um, and, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what kind of particle it is. All sorts of people are searching for that. And there are clues in the cosmic micro background which will help us figure out what the dark matter is too. So all these different things you can do with science by pulling together hundreds of experts in cosmic microwave background radiation are gonna to work together to build this stage four mission.
Um, we've been funded to come up with a concrete plan. And in fact, this week during the days, we're meeting all virtually now to, to come up with better plans and specifically to coordinate how can these science questions, these models, be answered best with the observations um, that we'll be making. So please stay tuned. And the final question I asked for you is when we're done with CMB S4, will we be done? No. That's what I'd like to hear from uh, people supporting science. It's really great. And I I'm, and I'm, I'm feel privileged to share just a little bit of a slice of the excitement we have um, with the resources you, 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 you let us use to do the science. Um, and I'm happy to find out what you want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sir. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Jeremy Benson. Jeremy Benson is our STEM educator in NIU STEAM, and uh, he has done so many wonderful things for our, our, our NIU STEAM. He actually just is completing a whole summer that he has planned and several other instructors. We had STEM camps for the summer, so we did a great job of that. And I will be talking about STEM Fest a little bit later, but he's also going to be having workshops every Saturday during the month of October. So you will probably, if you haven't seen Jeremy before, you probably will be seeing him soon. But anyway, Jeremy has spent quite a bit of time looking at the skies and trying to figure out how we can help the audience at home, as well as the one here, think about what is going to be up in that sky tonight. As you know, this is the peak meteor shower uh, two or three days, uh, and that's why we chose this time. And also, um, he has uh, taken some pictures, I think, with his telescope. <laughs> I'm going to let him tell you what he can. But he's going to talk about what you can see in the skies tonight. So, Jeremy? All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone at home for, for tuning in, and thank you to all of you who are here. As uh, some of the speakers said earlier, it is really great to be out among actual people. Um, as Judy said, I just finished up doing uh, summer camps, and we did all of our camps virtually this summer. Uh, myself and an entire group of people made that happen. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to people through a computer screen. It is very nice to actually have some people in front of you, or in front of me. Um, as Judy said, I spend a lot of time going out and doing presentations to school children as well, so I've been missing out on that. So it's nice to actually have an audience in front of me that's not uh, on a screen. So, as Judy mentioned, this is all about the Perseid meteor shower. That's why we do this at this particular time of uh, year, every year. And so let's talk a little bit about those meteors, as well as what else can we see. Because one of the things that we've always done with this event is make it a stargazing, so that you guys are not just hearing about things and learning about things, but we're actually doing some observing. The digital virtual format makes it a little bit harder for us to share that with you folks at home, but I wanted to make sure that everybody knew what was out so that we know what to look for while we're out looking for meteors. So we're going to talk about meteors, obviously. We're going to talk about the moon. We're going to talk about some of the other planets that are out there and maybe a little bit more after that. So first off, what are meteors? We're all here because of the meteor shower. There's meteors, meteoroids, meteorites, all a lot of words floating around. So let's get our vocabulary straight before we start out here. A meteoroid is an object in space. So like our picture here, we have chunks of rock floating around in space, meteoroids, asteroids. Once that meteoroid gets close enough to the Earth, it's going to start falling through our atmosphere. And that creates a lot of friction, just like we saw with the Orion uh, video there, as that capsule comes through the atmosphere, it creates a lot of air resistance, a lot of heat, a lot of friction, and it gets very hot, it starts to glow. Well, these rocks, these meteoroids do the same thing. So as they come streaking through the atmosphere very fast, they get very hot and they start to glow. And so that's what we see as a shooting star. So the shooting star, the actual a uh, luminescent object is what we call a meteor. So when we have many of them, we have a meteor shower, and there are several of them that happen annually. And then once we find that chunk of rock on the ground, it is then a meteorite. And the easiest way that I have to remember that is we think of that, that uh, suffix there at the end, it, generally has to do with minerals, right? We think of anorthosite and things that are ferrite. So it's a mineral. So when we find that rock on the ground, that is a meteorite. 
So we have a lot of them, hopefully, falling through the sky tonight. Here are some interesting facts about meteor showers from our friends at Sky and Telescope. So as we said, the meteors are actually debris crashing through our atmosphere. In this case, that debris is leftovers from a comet. This is a comet swift tunnel that we are passing through the remains of right now. So as that comet orbits around the Earth, it is constantly disintegrating and leaving a trail behind it, kind of littering as it travels through space. And if that comet happens to intersect with our orbit, as Swift Tuttle does, as we pass through that stream, those objects then get captured in our atmosphere and they burn up on their way through. So we see lots of them. Perseids are the best meteor shower that we see annually, at least usually they are. Um, they have more meteors, so that it's a denser field than many of the other regular and annual showers that we see. So ideally, you now it varies a little bit year to year, but it should be the most uh, visibly uh, spectacular of the regular meteor showers. These meteors are hitting the Earth's upper atmosphere at about 37 miles per second. So that would take, that's about the distance from where we are right here in Elburn to Naperville in a second. So that is incredibly fast. I wish we could get to Naperville that fast. Um, but if we did, we would be encountering a whole lot of air resistance and we would probably heat up and glow ourselves. So maybe it's better that we don't. And Every once in a while, when you're out watching the meteor showers, you'll see the, the shooting stars, but every once in a while you get one of those great big green fireballs, right, that lights up the sky and it leaves that trail behind it that sort of hangs there for a few seconds. What that is is that that meteor is large enough that it is actually, and it's uh, heated up enough that it's superheated the gas, the air that it's traveling through to become a plasma. And so it continues to glow for several seconds after the meteors streak through the area. So that's, that's kind of the best ones, right? Those are what we're all looking for. That's what we're hoping to see is those great big green fireballs. So as we said, the, uh, the meteor showers in general happen when we cross through the trail of a comet. So does that mean that we are on a collision course with that comet? Possibly, probably not. Uh, scientists have actually done the math on this, and there is very little danger for at least the next oh, thousand years. Um, I don't remember the exact date on this, but when the next closest approach that they're worried about, there's like a 0.00001% chance it might hit Earth. So, not real high. I wouldn't worry too much about it. But technically, the answer is yes, because we are passing through that same space, our orbits do intersect at this point that we are occupying right now. So if the comet happened to be here at the same time, it might get a bit crowded. But we don't expect that to happen anytime soon. So as we said, the debris falls up, heats up as it falls through the air, and there are several other annual showers as well. So we have a list of these. Uh, this can be found many, many places online. Uh, we have here the Perseids, which are best viewed pre-dawn, so we'll be able to see some tonight. Uh, you'll be able to see some actually last night and again for the next couple of days, but tonight is actually the peak. We should be able to see the most of them tonight. And the later up you're willing to stay, uh, later you're willing to stay up, or if you want to get up nice and early in the morning before the sun rises, that's the best time to see them. Uh, there are several others that are very spectacular. The Geminids are coming up in December. Uh, we just finished the Delta Aquarius, which we might be able to see one or two stragglers that are still hanging around from them, but mostly everything we see tonight is going to be from the swift tunnel remains. So what is the best way to observe a meteor shower? For those of you that aren't here with us, what steps should you be taking at home to make sure you're getting the optimum viewing experience? So first of all, you want to go somewhere dark. Uh, right here we have these lights set up and shining on us, so when we're done with the presentations we're going to make sure to turn those off so that our eyes can adjust. It takes about 30 minutes for your eyes to really adjust to the darkness. So for about the first half hour you're outside, you're not going to be able to see as many things as you will later on. Our eyes slowly adjust, your pupils dilate, or I'm sorry, constrict. No, I was right the first time, dilate. And uh, my glasses are falling up here, love them. And so that allows you to bring in more light, which allows you to see those dimmer objects. 
Many of the meteors that will be out will be dimmer. So the, the darker the area is to start with, somewhere like a nice big open field, or if you can even drive way out into the country, away from any city lights. Um, around here, we're kind of fighting against the city glow from Chicago, Rockford, Aurora. But if you're willing to drive a little ways out into the, the country, it's not too bad. The next thing is, make sure you have lots of visible sky. So if you're in your backyard and you've got trees all along your property line and you can only see this little square patch of sky, you don't have nearly as much real estate to look at. So the more of the sky that you can see, the more chances you have to actually spot a meteor going through that area of the sky. The next thing is, you do not need a telescope. In fact, a telescope is a very poor tool for observing meteors. They move very fast. Uh, they are oftentimes fairly small. So to try and find one and track one with your telescope is virtually impossible. I have never heard of it being done. You might accidentally be able to catch one if it goes right through your frame when you're looking at something else. Probably not going to happen. Your best tools are a blanket, maybe a lounge chair, something so you can just lay back. The hood of the car works just fine. Just lay back and take in as much of the sky as you can and wait for the meteors to go shooting by. And like I said, be patient. It takes a while for your eyes to adjust. And that includes pulling out your phone, looking at anything that lights up, is gonna to start to reset that night vision. So you wanna make sure you keep things as dark as possible. Is there anywhere particular we should look? Well, not really. The meteors will appear everywhere in the sky, but their tails will all point back to the constellation we call Perseus, which coincidentally, this is the Perseid meteor shower, maybe not coincidentally, right? That is why we call it that. Because as we are traveling through space, we are moving towards the constellation of Perseus. And so as we are in this range here, where we're passing through that trail from Comet Swift-Tuttle, we are moving towards the constellation of Perseus. And so that gives us the effect, much like driving through a snowstorm or making the uh, jump to hyperspace. <laughs> What's directly in front of us, our path of motion, kind of stays the same, but everything else streaks out from that point. So as we look into the sky, we will see meteors anywhere. They could appear any place in the sky, but their tails are going to all point back towards Perseus. So that is the direction that we are moving through space and all those meteors are coming at us. So we've talked a lot about meteors. Hopefully we get to see a whole bunch of them, but what other things are out there? So there are a lot of things that we could look at tonight, next week, continuing on through the summer, as long as it's nice enough to go outside. The first of those is the moon. The moon is a wonderful object for us to observe, whether it's with the naked eye, a telescope, or even binoculars. Uh, the moon is the only object that is close enough for us to actually make out surface details. Now, even the strongest Earth-based telescopes aren't strong enough to see the remains of those lunar landers that we've left behind. But you can definitely make out things like craters and different types of surface features. So the moon is a very great thing to look at. It's going to rise a little after midnight, about 12.30. It'll set sometime tomorrow afternoon. And the best view is about 1.14 this morning. So what that is is a combination of when it's going to be darkest and when it's going to be highest in the sky. Now at this point, the moon is just going to be highest in the sky at that point. So that's the best time to go out and look at it. It's going to be up above any of that sky glow on the horizon, less chance of it being blocked by trees or other objects. We also have lots of currently visible planets. So here's an image uh, from a website called The Planets Today, which kind of shows a, an actual view of our solar system currently. So that is set up for right about this time right now. And we can see that the inner planets are rather small, Mercury is currently behind the Sun, so it is not visible to us. Venus and Mars are both out, though, as well as Jupiter and Saturn. And then way out here, if you've got a really nice telescope and some really dark skies, we've got Neptune and Uranus are also visible. So let's take a look at when we, are, we can view those. So for this evening, the things that we're going to go try and take a look at when we're done here, assuming that those clouds break up a bit, is Jupiter and Saturn. 
Jupiter and Saturn are very close to each other right now. We can see I've got the map up here right now for Jupiter. And if I add Saturn, they're just right next to each other to the south, which for us is that direction right there. For those of you at home, hopefully you have a compass and know which way is, is north and south for you. But for us, we're going to want to look right over towards the south, and we're going to see both of them just above the horizon. Jupiter rises about 613, Saturn about 640, and the best viewing for both of them is right around 11 o'clock, between 1030 and 1130. So if you go out when we're done here with a telescope, you should be able to get a fantastic view of both of those objects. If you're willing to stay up later tonight or get up again early in the morning, there are some spectacular things in the early morning sky. Uh, Venus is marvelous right now, but you've got to be up by about 5.30 in the morning to get out in time to see it. Um, because after that, the sun rises and it will set. Or I mean, when that's set, it will become uh, invisible. We will be blinded by the sunlight. The other option is Mars, which its best viewing is a little bit earlier, but if you go out about 4.35, you can probably get a chance to see both of them. Mars is also going to be in the south at that time, basically due south. Whereas Venus will be in the east as it rises with the sun. Remember Venus and Mercury being closer to the sun than we are. In order to look towards them, we also have to be looking towards the sun. So those two we can only see in the very early dawn or right in the evening before the sun sets. We have to be looking towards the sun, but the sun has to be just below the horizon so that we can still see that dimmer star, uh, dimmer planet. So we've got Venus and Mars in the early morning. Uh, for those of you with a really nice telescope or really dark skies, maybe we have some people viewing from Montana, Colorado, Arizona, some places with magnificent skies like that. Uranus and uh, Neptune are both visible in the early morning. Uh, but about 4.04 .04 is the best time for viewing Uranus and about 2.51 for viewing Neptune, so you got to get up a little bit earlier than the other two. Ooh, there we go. But if you are willing to and you have the equipment to do it, now, even with a decent pair of binoculars, you'll be able to make these two out as stars, but unless you know exactly where you're looking, it's really hard to tell the difference between them and another star. So this is more of the advanced lesson. Another thing that has been popular and talked about, so this is our other category, is another comet, Neowise. Now, Neowise does not cross our orbit. We will not be getting any meteor showers from it. But it is an object that has been passing through our solar system, or passing near visibly through our solar system. And it's gotten a lot of attention lately. Uh, some of you might have gotten a chance to see it earlier in the summer when it was out in the mornings. It is now out in the evenings. It's best viewed at about 9.46 PM. But it's, it's on its way out. It's getting pretty faint. And I haven't had much luck finding it yet. Um, hopefully some of you guys might, but I think we needed to check it out a little bit earlier in the summer. So we're a little, a little late in the season to catch that one, but hopefully Swift Tuttle will make up for it and give us some good viewing tonight. So some tips for generally observing as you guys go out tonight, whether it be with a telescope, whether it be with binoculars, whether it be with just a blanket and a good friend. Like I said, go somewhere dark with good visibility and be patient. Let your eyes adjust. Keep the phones put away. Now, the one caveat that I will make to that is there is a great app called SkyMap, which I use all the time, um, especially when we're doing this with the campers that we have on campus when we do telescoping. Um, and the way it works is it works with your uh, phone's GPS and compass. So it can tell exactly where you are and which way your phone is pointing. And it works like an augmented reality overlay. So you can basically just kind of point it at the sky and it will follow your movements and show you what you're looking at. So it will identify brighter stars, it will identify any objects like meteor shower, uh, the focal point of meteor showers, it will identify comets. So that's a great tool to be able to kind of look and see, okay, that's that star there, that's what I want to look at, and then you can aim your telescope accordingly. Keep the lights off, that's house lights, if you can get away from anywhere with street lights, the farther away you can get from any type of light, the better. Uh, the Google Sky Map actually has a, a dark screen, so it doesn't mess with your eyes. Anything else that you use on the phone, be very aware of. Like even just the bright white light from your phone screen, if you go to look at Facebook and post a picture of what you just saw, that's going to mess with your night vision. It's going to take you another 15 minutes or so to, to really readjust. So wait until you get home to post the stuff to Facebook. Um, if you're setting up a telescope, make sure you set it up somewhere steady. 
Uh, one thing that I've seen people do is set telescopes up like inside trying to look through a window or outside on a deck. And if we think about it, the telescope is magnifying things. So if you're looking through a window and there's a little speck of dust on your window or a tiny smudge, you're now magnifying that smudge. <laughs> if you step on the deck and you walk across and it vibrates, you are now magnifying those vibrations the same way. So it, your image will shape. If you're setting up a telescope, you want to do your best to set it up somewhere solid on ground and then try your best not to even touch it. When we're looking through it, I always advise people to just kind of hover right over the eyepiece, get as close as you can without touching it, because any touch, any contact is going to cause that scope to shake, and then that's going to cause your image to vibrate. And again, if you're magnifying your image 60 times, you're magnifying that vibration 60 times as well. Like I said, many objects are visible even with a good pair of binoculars. If you have a decent pair of binoculars, that's enough to see the rings of Saturn which is one of, you know, I think the most impressive things that you can look at. Um, and last of all, be patient. It takes a while to find things sometimes. It takes a while to wait for your eyes to adjust. So bring a friend, bring a blanket, and just hang out and take your time, and I bet you're going to see some very cool stuff. So that is my presentation for this evening. We're going to move on to questions. I'm going to get the telescope set up, hopefully, here. We're under a tent for those of you at home, so I can't see what the clouds are doing right this second. But hopefully they're coordinating, and we will get some stargazing done tonight. For those of you at home, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to turn things back over to Judy. Thank you. Some people are already uh, sending me some questions, and uh, somebody's trying to take them. Uh, the questions offline to see what people are asking. So we're going to give people about five minutes to to do some questions. And I have more note cards over there if you need them. So please uh, come up and hear some more questions. So we'll just give it about uh, two, three minutes, and then uh, we'll start asking the questions. Jeremy, let me thank you for the highlights you gave us. Oh, there's one little piece of advice that I'd like to add to that is while you're out there, be amazed. We don't get to do this that much. And we like to brag about how smart we are with the internet and everything. But people 100 or 200 years ago knew the sky much better and were much more amazed by it. So even if you don't see any of it shooting stars, just enjoy the night. And be honest. All right. Um, the first question, well, I'm going to stand on the side of, you don't need to see me. Um, Will being on the moon and leaving equipment on it affect its effect on Earth's tides? Ooh. Any other possible negative effects? What a great, what a great question. Uh, you know, the moon is a is a very large object, and the equipment that we we have there, we've left there, and any equipment we'll leave there probably won't have uh, would be a neg negligible effect on Earth. Uh, the thing about water on the moon and going to the south area, southern area of the moon, we hope to use that water. I mean, if, if you've got water there, that's that's something you don't have to bring with you. So maybe you can build things out of the moon material and the water and have a lot less gravity, so it would be, um, it would not cost as much to launch it off the moon, maybe to that little space station where you could build things out of it. So. I think we will eventually be mining the moon, and, and uh, that would have a bigger effect, but not anything to, to affect the, uh, the tides of the Earth. Thank you. Uh, here's the next one. Do galaxies collide? Uh, if galaxies are moving away, how do some collide, given that they do collide? Okay, so yeah, galaxies do collide. And in about four or five billion years, uh, I don't know the, I don't remember the exact number, but our galaxy is going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. So it's going to be really good stargazing about four hundred five million billion billion years from now. Um, and so I was talking about the expansion in general, and everybody was sitting at their at their um, in their chairs being stationary, and then galaxies would not collide. However, if we get up and start walking around, just because the space between us is expanding, if I'm walking towards you fast enough, I can still come and get you. I can still run into you. 
So that's called a locomotion. And I think that's a little bit when I was distracted by the pic people sitting at picnic tables. You're kind of like gravitationally bound to each other. Your gravity is all attracting each other so much that even though the giants are pulling you apart, your gravitational forces were strong enough to keep some of these local groups together. <laughs> For example. And hopefully you're bound by more than just gravity. Right. So his question is, how, how, do, how, do, I, how do scientists feel about the fact that um, the universe has no edge? How do I, what? How do you deal with that? How do I deal with the fact that the universe has no edge? Um, well, not, it's not um, going to affect how I get home tonight. So, you know, on a day-to-day level. But intellectually, how do you deal with that? Uh, one thing I like to think about is that the, uni that the universe is finite. That's one, I think, very important thing. It's only so big. Now, it's big. Don't get me wrong. It's a big thing, right? And even if there are multiverses, many multiverses put together is also big. But I like to think of it as being finite. Right? And as having no edge, Right? It's just like the surface of the earth has no edge. Right? Just go start walking. Right? Eventually, if you keep going long enough, and if you can um, have your pontoon shoes on so you can walk on water, right? you'll go all the way around and come back. So we know that the surface of the earth itself is finite. It's only so big. Right? But I can't say I'm going to fall off the edge of the earth. Right? That didn't help at all. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, from time to time you sit around and think about these things, and in fact, that's what motivated people to say this idea of a primordial atom in a big bang is just so strange that there's a definite edge. It's the edge in time is what drove people crazy. And it's easier to think about an eternal universe, which is constantly has little bits of this same kind of spontaneous generation going on. That was easier for them to deal with. And I'll leave it to your sensibilities to decide which is more upsetting, one big bang or a continuous string of little bangs. You can tell me which one you prefer, but then I'm going to tell you the data I showed you prefers the big bang. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. All right, I'm going to give you this question to to read okay. uh, and figure out, and while right. we, we have another question. So, so I'll, I'll read this to myself, or shall I read it out loud now? Uh, you can do both. Okay. Some efforts have been made to build very arrays that are geographically distributed. Yes, it's a very important use of the South Pole Telescope was to take that picture of the black hole. Maybe that's what we're talking about here. Have there, have there been since large arrays from measuring and imaging the CMD residue, and small useful detectors could be deployed by amateurs at large citizen science projects? Um, yes, so indeed, CMBS-4 is not going to be one telescope. It's going to be about a dozen telescopes. And the exact number, we're still trying to figure out exactly the right the thing to do is. And a few of them are going to be big telescopes with very fine particular, you know, to get the fine details. Others are going to be smaller telescopes, which can cover large areas of the skies faster. So we're going to get both the big picture and the details in the right balance so that we can maximize the amount of science that comes out. Um, so it very much is going to be a vaster right now. Um, well, so that, so uh, I could read you the entire science and uh, project proposal book for CMBS4 to tell you the details of that, but go to cmbs4.org for details. I think the last question on oh. that sheet is for you as well. 1016 and 1019, you might be able to expect X3737B. Um, that's a puzzle. 
<laughs> did, did somebody here write this, or is this from YouTube? Yeah, somebody uh, that is in the remote audience uh, wrote that. I don't. This sounds like a rocket question. <laughs> the X three, the X thirty seven B. Is that one of your rockets? The X thirty seven B. See what I'm doing here? I think the X thirty seven B maybe the the, um, the kind of the mini shuttle that the military uh, puts up. Actually, uh, when NASA was building the International Space Station, one of the things they thought about was a crew return vehicle. If there was an emergency, how to get the crew back? Uh, could you build a vehicle they could just get into and it would automatically fly them back and they wouldn't have to really be pilots to do that. So they were going to test a vehicle like a mini shuttle at the fit and they were going to they were going to take it up in the space shuttle, uh, take, get it out of the, the cargo bay and have it do some tests uh, flying back. And uh, for budget reasons, NASA didn't continue that, but they gave all of that, all of the work they'd done, they gave to the Air Force in DARPA and the Air Force flies this mini shuttle now, and it spins uh, over a year. It can spend over a year in orbit. It's unmanned. It has a little cargo bay, and it has a solar panel to power it. We don't know exactly what it what it's uh, doing, but it's uh, doing some sort of research for the military, and I think that's what the, the X thirty seven B is. I mean, with with all due respect, astronomers say they have really nice telescopes. But they're pointed the wrong direction. <laughs> well, the, the military actually, they've given some of their big spy satellite mirrors to NASA to build some. Uh, In fact, the W first mission, they had a leftover telescope. And so, W first mission, which was I, on, I was on and got canceled under another name, um, they said, yeah, let's do it. So, they're using the leftovers from the military. Yes, that should be cool. Uh, the next one, how did Apollo 16 departure get recorded? Is uh, the recording equipment still there? That is a great question. So the last three missions uh, of the Apollo program, 15, 16, and 17, carried uh, what they called the Lunar uh, Rover, which was a car built by GM that folded up in, in, and fit in one of the empty bays of the descent stage of the lunar lander. So when the astronauts landed on the moon, they kind of lowered it down, they unfolded it, and uh, they used it to travel several miles away uh, on the moon to reach areas they had never, they couldn't walk. So when Apollo 16 was getting ready to launch, uh, to, for the astronauts to go back to the command module and come back home, they left the camera on, and the camera actually took a uh, video, and that's so when we saw that video of the ascent stage uh, launching from the descent stage. That was a camera controlled on Earth, the camera on the lunar roving vehicle. And uh, it's not working anymore, but you know what? With some uh, new batteries, those vehicles may work. So if we go back there, you know, it's interesting. One, one I'll give you one fun fact. There was actually a NASA manual for if, if something went wrong with that ascent stage and it couldn't get powered, to turn that rocket engine on, there was some uh, procedures for hot wiring it to the lunar rover, so it'd be like a jump start to jump that engine. So that is, if you look that up. That is a, a true statement. There were instructions on how to hot wire the lunar rover to that ascent stage to get it to launch off the moon. All right. I have a couple that I'm going to address here based on the, uh, the stargazing questions, and then I'm going to go start getting our telescopes set up, uh, set up out here. So the first question that I wanted to answer was we had somebody in the virtual audience ask, are we going to be streaming the stargazing? Unfortunately, no. Uh, we did try to get some equipment to, to help with that and to make that possible. Um, it doesn't work as well as I hoped it would, and so it's just not going to turn out the way we, we wanted it to. So unfortunately, we are not going to be able to broadcast the stargazing portion. Uh, for the rest of us who are here, I did also get a little phone mount for it so that we'll be able to have uh, whatever images we do find on a phone screen so we don't all have to come up and get too personal with the, uh, the telescope so we can maintain some social distancing while we're doing that. Uh, the next question that I had based on stargazing is, can the planets be seen just today or for a while? 
Uh, so the planets move very slowly through our solar system. So they are going to be right where they are relative to the other stars and things in the sky for quite some time. Um, and in fact, over the years, they move a little bit less for the farther planets, more so for the, the nearer planets, uh, Jupiter and uh, Mercury and Venus. Their uh, orbits are much shorter than Earth's. So in one year, we see them change position through their entire orbit. Whereas the outer planets rotate much slower, orbit much slower than the Earth does. So for every one of our orbit, they may only make a fraction of their orbit. So they don't move nearly as quickly in the sky. So for the rest of the summer, they're going to be right where they are. Next summer, they'll be very near to where they are this summer, but they will have shifted a little bit by then. Uh, another question we had is, why are there other regular meteor showers? And so the regular meteor showers come from points where our orbit intersects with the orbits of those other comets. So where a comet has passed by a place that we will soon be, it leaves some junk behind, it leaves a trail of debris. And so as we pass through those trails, we get our regularly occurring meteor showers. Now sometimes there are just pockets of, of debris floating around in space that may have drifted from another comet trail or just part of some other collision. So we do get unpredicted meteor showers. We may just pass through a, a cloud of dust that isn't tied to any particular uh, asteroid or any comet or we don't know what it's tied to. So there are also random meteor showers that happen unpredictably. But those annual ones that we can expect are all due to comet trails that we pass within close proximity to. Um, then there was one more question on this page. Is Swift Tuttle itself currently visible from Earth? Currently, it is not. Uh, the last time it passed close enough to be visible was 1992. It has about a 130-year orbital period. So the next time we are expected to be able to see it from Earth is 2126. Um, and if anyone is still around then, it is expected to be a very bright, visible with the naked eye object at that time. I'm probably not going to be there to see it. Is it red or blue? Uh, <laughs> what is the it in that sentence? <laughs> that, I think that one was for somebody else. Yeah, that, that one goes oh. All right. Do we have any other stargazing questions for people in the audience here? Anybody want to throw one more at me virtually before I go set up our telescope? Yeah, as you come out over our tent is something very bright that we can see. It. Okay, we will we'll head out over there and check out what it is that you guys have got spotted already. Think it's Mars? All right, well, let's, we'll take a look and we'll find out. All right, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna hand this off and we will continue on with our parade of questions.